Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jeremy Leffler, and I work in the policy office at the National Science Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another session of the NSF Virtual Grants Conference. And I'm now pleased to present this session, which will cover the programs in the NSF Directorate for Mathematical and Physical Sciences, and it will be presented by Kelsey Cook. Good afternoon, my name is Kelsey Cook, and I'm here to try to answer all of your questions about the Directorate of Mathematical and Physical Sciences in just an hour and leave a little time for questions. As you'll see in my initial slides, that's a pretty tall order. Because the slides are available to you both before and after this session, I plan to skim over some of them in order to leave as much time as possible for questions at the end. I'd rather answer the questions you have than the ones I think you have. I came to NSF in 2006 from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, where I did research in mass spectrometry. I'm a senior advisor to the chemistry division here, but I spent nearly two years on detail in the math and physical sciences office of the assistant director and another 14 months at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. So I hope my perspective is broad enough to at least be able to direct your questions, if not answer them. I encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A at any time. Here's a broad overview of the material that I've been asked to cover. Don't be intimidated if a topic of interest isn't on the list. If something relevant to NSF and or to grantsmanship in general is on your mind, send along a question and I'll try to answer it. You're, you've likely seen some of this information in earlier presentations. I'm just going to highlight that with a budget of just over one and a half billion dollars, math and physical sciences is the largest NSF directorate. While our mission certainly focuses on the disciplines in our name, we also recognize that each of our divisions is highly interdisciplinary. This prompts me to make two observations. First, it's very important to find the right home for your proposal. In cases where that's not obvious, it's a good idea to contact a program officer, usually by emailing a one-page summary of your idea. Second, you can usually specify more than one program on the cover page if you feel your work genuinely straddles two or more disciplines. The program listed first will at least initially manage the review, but the other programs may participate in co-review and perhaps co-funding if the proposal reviews well. The new Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide describes a new system called a concept outline, which uses another new system called Program Suitability and Proposal Concept Tool or Prospect as a more formal way than just uh, email for that first inquiry. In some ways, MPS is more diverse than the other directorates in that our five divisions each address foundational long-term research in a distinct discipline with less of a unifying theme that you might find, for example, in biology or geoscience. Our Office of Multidisciplinary Activities strives to bridge this diversity, not by funding proposals directly, but by working in the background to foster and enable interactions across the foundation and with other agencies, other sectors, and even other governments. They also play a major role in efforts targeting workforce development and broadening participation. Although this slide is a little bit dated, from it you can get a detailed snapshot of the directorate in the math and physical sciences brochure. Here's an example of the kind of detail that you'll find in the brochure. Uh, from this, if you wanted to do the arithmetic, you could estimate an NSF funding rate on the order of 25%. And an average award size uh, you can also get from this. You can see that there was in this particular year, which is 2001, there was $181 million used to seed uh, private public partnerships. And that's a number that's likely to exceed with the creation of our new technology innovation and partnerships directorate. If you want even more data, this information can be found in the annual request to Congress, which is available under the About NSF tab on the 
nsf.gov website. If we zoom in to look at the numbers, you can find information relative to funding rates and award size, but these are all numbers with very large standard deviations. It's a good idea to visit the NSF award database and search for current awards in your general research area in order to get an idea of typical award sizes. The best advice on this point is always to ask for what it takes to do the research that you want to do. You can adjust the scope of that research to ensure that a proposal budget is in line with those in a target program. This shows trends in NSF funding rates, which you might stretch to say has a small increase perhaps. Uh, and if you look at it, that's partly attributable to a small decrease in the number of proposals. This is similar data for MPS funding rates. It's also increasing over time, also partly because of small decreases in proposal counts. The number of proposals, by the way, on this slide differs from that on slide nine, uh, probably because one is counting projects and the other is counting proposals. If you look at trends in the foundation's funding over several years, I think the only word that comes to mind is that it's been pretty flat. Uh, and that's why as the number of proposals goes down, the funding rates have a tendency to go up. So now I'd like to move from consideration of statistics to consideration of math and physical sciences science. And in particular, I want to feature a few of the programs that are responding to current NSF-wide and government-wide initiatives. Since I'm in the chemistry division, I'm going to use the prerogative of choosing a chemistry example first. This was the chemistry division's response to the biotechnology priority area for NSF the last couple of years. There has been an annual theme to the molecular foundations of biotechnology. The theme for FY23 is in development, gives me an opportunity to suggest that if you sign up for our divisional biweekly newsletter, sort of a blog, it's a good way to stay current and to find out, for instance, what the new theme will be as soon as we know what the new theme is. Other divisions have similar opportunities that I encourage you to look into. Another NSF-wide priority and government-wide right now is the quantum leap or all things doing with quantum science. Uh, this slide emphasizes that we had the first quantum revolution. Uh, this picture at the top is from 1926 and features, among others, Albert Einstein and Madame Curie. But we're in the midst of the second quantum revolution, which is illustrated in part by the example in the lower right-hand corner here, something called a Majorana fermion, or at least an emulating a Majorana fermion, that's a particle that its own, that's its own antiparticle, something with implications for quantum computing as well as quantum sensing. So there are elements of this quantum science across math and physical sciences, and many specific solicitations have evolved to try to advance this science. For example, there are a number of quantum leap science institutes, challenge institutes, these are large awards on the order of $25 million or so with many investigators tackling big challenges. Uh, another example with a little narrower focus are these quantum leap sensing challenges for transformational advances in quantum systems. Uh, another ongoing solicitation, the details are available as specified on the slide. Another priority of MPS directorate is broadening participation. And the quantum initiative gives me a chance to point out a case where we're trying to advance both of these aims, the quantum science aim and the broadening participation aim by trying to expand quantum information science and engineering, that is to fund partnerships between typically underfunded organizations or uh, underserved organizations and larger partners. 
this program is outlined in the given solicitation and you can extract details. In the first year of this program, we funded quite a few of these centers. I think the total there is something like $25 million, $22 million on that order. So moving from the quantum realm to climate and sustainability realm, again, I'll use the prerogative of being a chemist to tell you something that chemistry is very active in. Critical Aspects of Sustainability is a program that was spearheaded by the chemistry division and is now spreading across other divisions and directorates in engineering and in the TIP or Technology Innovation Partnerships program. Again, this is a meta program. It's not something to which you submit directly. A meta program is something that you designate in the title of your proposal, but then you submit your proposal to the closest matching program, in this case, in either MPS engineering or TIP. This has an annual theme. Uh, the annual theme for the current year, I believe, is still in development, so stay tuned for more details about that. Not wanting to give short shrift to our colleagues in astronomy, Windows on the Universe was one of the 10 big ideas a few years ago, but it remains a very important problem area for MPS. And so this Windows of the Universe multi-messenger astrophysics is another meta program. That is to say, it's not something that you submit directly to, but it's something to which you can, something you can designate in the title of the program. Usually it'll be something you submit to the astronomy division. And it has to do with drawing the threads of the different kinds of measurement tools that we have, measuring particles, measuring electromagnetic frequency, and measuring other phenomena, gravitational waves. Another meta program is computational and data enabled science and engineering or cds and e that's a meta program it doesn't accept proposals directly but you designate cds and e in the title of your proposal and that tips off the program officer who receives it that this has content relevant to what was called harnessing the data revolution before that it was just called big science big data rather uh, it's a challenge that's ongoing across all parts of MPS and actually our parts of NSF. Uh, it is engaged by MPS engineering and size computer information science and engineering directorates. Uh, submit to the most relevant program once again. Another program that many of you are probably very familiar with is the major research instrumentation program. That is a program that formally accepts proposals uh the current solicitation is listed down there at the bottom as 18-513 uh that's getting rather old for an nsf solicitation it is periodically updated and as i've said many times already you might want to keep an eye on the nsf website or subscribe to one of the nsf uh, bulletin boards so that you will know if there are changes in that program this year Another one that definitely does have changes coming is designing materials to revolutionize and engineer our future, or DEMREF. DEMREF is NSF's response to the Materials Genome Initiative. It engages people in MPS engineering and the Computer and Information Science Directorate. And the last solicitation was a one-off. And so I think there will be a 23 version coming soon to a computer near you. This is intended to push the frontiers of materials. Uh, it is an iterative, historically has been an iterative process among theory, experiment, uh, data, and synthesis to try to get materials to do the jobs we need them to do. Another NSF-wide initiative is the Artificial Intelligence or Machine Learning Initiative. And one example of a solicitation or actually a meta program uh, pointing to that, this is actually a solicitation. A solicitation pointing to that initiative is this ADAPT, 
advancing discovery with artificial intelligence powered tools. Uh, you can read here that ADAPT is takes submissions either as supplements or as awards for eager or early concept awards or raise multidisciplinary proposals uh, for things that have to do with, with implementing artificial intelligence in science projects. Details are available at this dear colleague letter site. All programs in MPS are active participants in the career program. The career program has been around for quite a long time. I believe it's one of the most important programs at NSF in that it really directs the future of our disciplines by helping to jumpstart the most capable faculty members early in their career. Uh, I think it's an important program. It's unique, almost unique in that it funds five-year awards instead of three-year awards. Uh, it's available to people who are in tenure track assistant professor or equivalent positions. So once you get tenure, you can no longer do a career proposal. And it is, you get three tries. Uh, some people score on the first try. It's not uncommon to take two or three. It's a highly competitive program. The only thing about the career program that bothers me is its name. It tends to encourage young faculty to propose a whole career's worth of research in 15 pages. You simply can't do that. So I encourage you to focus, think about a five-year scope, not a 30-year career. Uh, you can certainly devote some of the space in your career proposal to describing what your long-term aims and your long-term views is are, but give us a plan, especially for the first two or three years of your career research, and maybe with a little less detail for the fourth and fifth year. That's what the career program supports. It uniquely requires that there be an endorsement letter from your department head or equivalent. Make sure that's there. And I like to remind people that uh, we don't put very many restraints on what that letter says. It must certify that you're eligible. Uh, it's an opportunity for your department head to say something <clears throat> that makes clear that your department is really enthused and they think that your research fits well into their departmental aims and perhaps that uh, they are prepared to support you as you pursue your promotion and tenure. I now have a few slides, six slides, describing five programs in MPS that attempt to broaden participation, that attempt to enhance the pipeline for the future of science and engineering. Two relatively new ones in this track are LEAPS and ASCEND. The LEAPS program is sort of a prelude to a career proposal. So it's for young faculty who for one reason or another, maybe because they're resource limited, uh, maybe for other reasons, they don't feel ready to submit a career proposal yet. LEAPS is an attempt or an opportunity rather for them to submit a proposal before in preparation for a career proposal and the rest of their career. Ascend is an MPS program that funds postdoctoral opportunities for aspiring faculty. These are described in detail at the indicated solicitations. And if you are eligible for either of these, I encourage you to look up those specific solicitations. A fairly unusual program is the MPS AGEP Graduate Research Supplement. AGEP is the Alliance for Graduate Education and the Professorate. It's run out of the Education Directorate. It's been around for a long time. It is a program that attempts to help universities mentor uh, primarily people from underrepresented groups, but also people who have aspirations to pursue an academic career and who may be otherwise in danger of abandoning those hopes. Once you become an AGEP institution, you are an AGEP alumnus forever. And AGEP institutions and AGEP alumni are eligible for this graduate research supplement from the Math and Physical Sciences Directorate. That is to say, suppose you have an award from my program and you're at an AGEP institution. A student 
probably from an underrepresented group, comes along and expresses some interest in your program, but you've already committed all of your funds to other students who are currently there. You could contact me first by email and then eventually by a formal supplement request. Explain this situation. Explain to me that you have an opportunity to expand the scope and expand the impact of your funded research by adding an additional graduate student. That is a basis for an AGIP graduate research supplement. Uh, they are renewable, I think, maybe twice, at least once. Uh, they're one-year supplements to get this person started. There is a corresponding program on which I don't have a slide that is for veterans. So in a similar circumstance, if a veteran comes to you with interest in your research and you have used up all the funds in your award, you can approach me and say, I would like an MPS veteran supplement, and we can look into the possibility of that. Okay, so that's one of the broadening participation initiatives. Another broadening participation initiative that spans four of the five divisions of MPS are these partnerships for research and education. So NPS runs a lot of large centers. They have a lot of large facilities. These are all wonderful places uh, for research on a grand scale. We also support research at a lot of small universities and a lot of underserved universities. These partnerships for research and education are proposals that come from one of those underserved institutions and propose to make a partnership with one of our large centers or one of our large facilities. Uh, there have been, these have been around in material science for a long time. So this PREM is such a program for the material science, for instance, the MERSECs, Materials Research Science and Engineering Centers. Uh, a little bit, quite a bit newer actually, are PAIRs or PARs, Partnerships in Astronomy and Astrophysics Research and Education. Uh, that would be to probably to go and use some of the telescopes, for example, from a small school. Details at the indicated uh, websites. Physics has a partnership in education and physics, and chemistry has one in chemistry. And all these programs are out there. The applicants should be those underserved institutions that would like to establish a partnership with the big program. Uh, you need to discuss it with that program before you approach NSF directly. Um, and we do list in those solicitations, those in those large facilities, those large centers that are willing to partner. Finally, the newest of these outreach opportunities that I know of is this Dear Colleague letter from MPS providing funding of up to $6,000 to support up to two pre-identified high school students to come work on your funded project. So if you have an NSF grant from MPS and you encounter a high quality high school student, perhaps from an underrepresented group, but I don't think that's required, uh, you can approach us and ask for funds to provide summer research opportunity to that individual. The individual must be identified in advance. It can't just be a blanket search to try to find someone later uh, and we can support that kind of an appointment. And I should point out that both the directorate and most of the individual divisions within the directorate do these new investigator workshops to try to help young faculty uh, understand our system a little better, which is what we're doing with this workshop right now, uh, but perhaps in a little more personal way. Uh, at least for the one within the chemistry division, most department heads were allowed to nominate one member of their faculty, possibly a second member if the second member was underrepresented. Uh, we have been able to return to live interactions on these centers, as you can tell from this picture here of the MPS wide one. Uh, another reason to check with our blogs, uh, make sure your department head knows about this opportunity. And if you have an interest, it's really a good chance not only to learn about grantsmanship to learn about NSF, but also to network with your colleagues at the same 
phase of their research. We're nearing the end. I have a few slides about undergraduate research opportunities, two slides, two programs. Uh, I am one of many who came, who did my undergraduate work at a predominantly undergraduate institution or a PUI. Uh, I think they actually support and train a very disproportionate fraction of chemists and scientists and engineers. So we recognize that through this very long in the tooth, but important solicitation called the research at under primarily undergraduate institutions uh, or RUI, Research and Undergraduate Institutions Solicitation, which is 14-579. This is sort of a meta program that you don't submit directly to RUI. You submit to a program elsewhere in NSF, but you designate this as an RUI proposal by doing two things. First, by beginning your title with the letters RUI colon, and secondly, by including as supplementary documents, a certification that your institution is eligible, and that eligibility depends on the number of advanced degrees your institution provides every year. I think it's averaged over two years. Uh, and an RUI impact statement, which is another unusual opportunity. It's up to five pages, I think, and it explains how funding this award may broadly impact research at the undergraduate institution. The other thing that submitting an RUI proposal does for you is that it flags both to the program officer and to the reviewers the fact that this is coming from an institution that does not have access to full-time PhD graduate students. And therefore, it's expected that the pace of research and therefore the scope of research may be less than what it is at a PhD granting institution. But the quality of the research, the intellectual merit, the broader impacts, which you've heard about earlier in the week, is not different. So this is a way to slightly uh, tweak the expectations of reviewers, not that the quality is any different, but that the scope and pace might be different. There is also, I think, incorporated into this uh, document a description of research opportunity awards. These are supplements that are made to current awardees to support, for instance, summer research or sabbatical research on the part of a PUI faculty member. It's viewed that, that many of these PUI faculty members have limited opportunities to do research at their institution. And so a summer research can establish new collaboration that enhances their research opportunities. Finally, we have a very large number of REU research experiences for undergraduate sites across the country. This map <clears throat> vastly understates the case. It's a map I could get my hands on quickly. It's the recent plot of DMR sites. But uh, there are in fact currently 903 REU awards across NSF. Those support sites in all 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Uh, it's, I did an REU when I was an undergraduate. I did mine at Oak Ridge National Lab, but I also did one at Colorado College. Wonderful way to feed the pipeline. Many of these are exciting international opportunities. Uh, many of them focus on frontier science. Uh, make, if you have an interest in hosting a site, you should look at this solicitation and considering consider writing up an REU proposal. Uh, if you are an undergraduate student watching this, these are a small fraction of the opportunities of for NSF supported research that you can engage. NSF, in fact, supports research and researchers at all levels from high school through established faculty. We do this through programs that are NSF-wide, through divisional programs, through MPS-wide programs, and through partnerships uh, with people outside of NSF. For example, we run workshops. We don't run them. We fund people to run workshops for us uh, at various sites and on current topics. That's how we get input 
what does the community think are the current priorities relevant to science covered by MPS? So hopefully I have answered a few of your questions and told you some interesting facts, but we have about a half, eh, 25 minutes left that I hope we can devote to answering your questions. Another good source for answering questions are the deputy division directors of the five MPS directorates. They're listed on this slide. And if you can find the right program officer by yourself, that's a good idea. You can do that by searching the NSF award database and finding a proposal that covers ground or finding an award that covers ground similar to what you'd like to cover in your proposal. Uh, but if you try that and fail, you don't know where to turn these deputy division directors are a reasonable place to turn your attention. And with that, I'd like to conclude the formal part of my presentation and turn our attention to the questions that you have. Thank you very much for joining us and for your attention. Okay, thank you, Kelsey, and I'd like to welcome you back. Kelsey has been answering questions uh, in the Q&A, so you'll see if you go and look on the answer tab, you'll see that he's been answering the questions that have been coming in so far. And um, I saw that a number of those questions were, uh, or a couple of them at least, were asking about specific eligibility requirements for different, different programs in MPS, including leap, the LEAP solicitation. And so one of the things, and Kelsey, you can answer this as well, but one of the things I would recommend highly is before you even contact the program officer to see if you're eligible to submit a proposal is look at the solicitation and look at the eligibility criteria. Because we spend a lot of time making sure that the eligibility criteria are clear and that's eligibility for the institution that submits the proposal, and then also eligibility criteria for uh, the PIs and co-PIs uh, for that program. So I saw that you had answered a, a question about that LEAP solicitation. I didn't see what you said, but um, I saw that you were typing a response. Um, we have a question, and I'm just going to, and I so please do continue to send your questions. We've got about 25 minutes. So um, first question is, about adding RUIs to, I don't know which program they're referring to, but or maybe they're talking about adding REUs. I'm not quite sure about that question, but. So that sounds like LEAPS if he's talking about a pre-career grant. So LEAPS is something for faculty who aren't quite ready yet to write a career proposal or to take that chance. And I, I suspect that you have, it's, the rules are that you can submit to only one solicitation. One proposal must go to one solicitation. But I think LEAPS is a dear colleague letter. I was just looking it up. Uh, no, it's actually a solicitation. And so you have to specify one or the other solicitation. RUI is actually a solicitation. So you could write a pre-career proposal. Many people do. You could make it an RUI proposal and you could submit it, have it evaluated, get feedback from it. Uh, it's not a bad idea at all, uh, but it wouldn't necessarily be a LEAPS proposal. And that's partly because the timing is different, partly because there are some special review criteria in the LEAPS, special eligibility criteria in the LEAPS. So in that instance, the answer would have to be one or the other, but not both. Okay, um, we had a question earlier about uh, submitting proposals for conference grants that you answered, and there was a, a clarification given about uh, funding to host a conference at our institution and whether NSF, particularly M MPS, is uh, making still making conference grants or and how that works from the M MPS perspective. So, yeah, my typed answer emphasized that this is disciplinary selective. So some disciplines support a great number of recurring conferences. Chemistry division does not, but we support workshops on special topics, and most of those take place at institutions, uh, specific institutions. The difference between a workshop and a conference is that a workshop is going to be trying to bring the community get together to look forward. What, what is the future direction? Conferences tend to look back. What's the latest I've accomplished in the past year, if it's a recurring meeting or in the past 
two or three years or whatever it is. Um, so I, I, it's a question that you should put to a program officer in the research area of your interest. And if you were to ask me as a chemist, I would say, you know, we do workshops all the time. We have done them even during the pandemic, but certainly now. Uh, we don't very often do conferences. Okay, and the, the, I will also just note that there are program funding opportunities that do have calls for conferences as part of their uh, as a as maybe a track or as a component of their of their uh, program. But you can also submit a conference proposal in accordance with the guidelines in the PAP guide. So if you want to uh, if you want to know about what how to do that, the PAP guide is the is your starting point for that. Um, I, and I, I should add, Jeremy, that. That conference proposal mechanism we also use for workshops. So, yes, yeah. uh, th we we use those words interchangeably um, uh, in terms of policy at NSF. So there's you know you can you, when you see conference you can also read workshop as well. So um, question about uh, um, let's see at we I think we covered the leaps the leap solicitation questions. Um, question asking, how does one get on the list of AGEP? So AGEP is a separate solicitation from MPS AGEP supplements. So I believe it's run by the, now it's called the Education and Human Resources Directorate. It used to be the or what? What is the no, name? No, now it's now it's um, it's EDU. It's STEM Education. STEM Education Directorate runs AGEP. Uh, which is something like advancing graduate education for the professorate. And that is for rather large grants to establish programs that try to help graduate students and uh, probably undergraduates even, it depends on what you propose, to stick through the curriculum and direct themselves towards the professorate, towards a career in academia. Uh, that's a proposal that you write to the EDU directorate. If it's competitive and gets funded, you then become an AGIP institution forever. You're then on the list that's eligible for AGIP awards. Uh, it's not something that's that's the only way I know of that you can become an AGIP institution. I sh in my written answer to one of the questions, uh, I pointed out that there's other ways to get student supplements. And if you're not eligible for AGIP, but you have an opportunity to advance an underrepresented student, you might have a conversation with your cognizant program officer who might be willing to fund that independent of AGIP status and AGIP. There's just a, there is a pool of funds set aside to help with AGIP, MPS AGIP supplements. Okay, the next question is asking if you can apply to career for the faculty early development career program the same year as LEAPS, or should there be a gap between LEAPS and career? <laughs> I know of an instance where it happened and the problem is overlap. You can't put the same research in the two proposals, but if you have a different idea, uh, then, you know, there's two possible outcomes. They, well, there's, I guess, several possible outcomes. They could both get declined. They could both get awarded or one and one. Um, but the key is that the, Ideas have to be different or else the awards would be subject to overlap problems. Uh, the next question is asking about funding for unaffiliated research or somebody who is not um, a, um, affiliated with a, with a university or institution. And let me just say that NSF does not fund directly unaffiliated individuals. Um, so that would not be possible. You'd have to be affiliated with an organization. And the reason for that is because of the, uh, you have to have viable internal controls to be able to deal with um, NSF funding, federal funding. So that's just not something that NSF does. Um, next question is, uh, when, when should you apply for supplementary funding? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the answer to that is as soon as you need it, as long as it's not too late in the award. Uh, you know, there's many different kinds of supplementary funding. The AGIP is one example. My program often does emergency repair supplements. We sometimes do international supplements if an opportunity for an international collaboration arises. These should be for things that you could not envision when you wrote the proposal. 
But if it gets too close to the end of the award, then probably that should be built into the next proposal. So that's a little bit vague on the back end, but almost any time in the first two years when an unex of a three-year award or the first four years of a five-year award, when a need comes up, if it's an emergency or an opportunity comes up that you couldn't foresee, the first thing to do is to have a conversation or send an email to your Cognizant Program Officer. And if the Cogn Cognizant Program Officer is responsive, thinks that it's a legitimate need and has resources, then you would write up a formal request. Okay, next question is asking about volunteering to be a reviewer. Uh, what, what do you have, uh, what kind of advice do you have for somebody who'd like to review uh, NSF proposals? Well, first of all, I should say it's a wonderful learning experience if you haven't done it. You, you, you get insight uh, that you really struggle to get by other means. The mechanism varies a little from division to vi division. My chemistry division, we have a place on the web page where you can click a button and indicate your interests and your availability. Um, but you can always send an email, usually with your curriculum vita, maybe a short form, doesn't have to be the long form, to a program officer where you think you would fit, where your interests are strong, and say you would really welcome the opportunity to serve the community in this capacity may not be an immediate response. Uh, my program, for instance, uh, solicits proposals just once a year. So you can't review if you're out of phase with that until the next year, or if you are competing, you know, if there's only one program that you really have strong interest in and you are a proposal pending in that, that program, you can't review for that program until your proposal has been this taken care of. But yeah, I urge you to send an email with your Vita to a PI, uh, to a PO program officer, and or check on the division website. I certainly know there is a link on the chemistry division website where you can make that interest known. And by the way, if any of you are more senior and have an interest in serving as a program officer, that's a conversation also worth having. And that will really give you a wonderful education. Uh, the next question I'm trying to... Uh determine what the question actually is, but it's asking about a program description, computational and data enabled science and engineering, um, that, which appears to have a year long uh, submission window. I'm looking at this now and it goes from September 1st of this year through mid-September next year. Um, well, Jeremy, it's not surprising you're confused because it's a fairly complex topic. Uh, there is a separate CDS and E competition. There is a, a working group at NSF that's interdirectorate that assesses some CDS and E proposals and rules for that are spelled out in the solicitation that you've identified. But it is also possible to add a designation CDS and E to, and, and that's computer and data enabled science and engineering. Uh, it is possible to add that designation as the start of a title of almost any proposal because it's also a meta program. So my program is chemical measurement imaging, but I have had several awards to which I appended or the PI appended. Yeah, either of us can do it. The cds &E acronym and which is advancing computer and data enabled science and engineering. And of course, I would go to that working group and try to get co-funding from them. But my program deadline is October 31st every year. So if you want to compete in the NSF wide competition, read 228084 and follow the rules. But if you have research that's suitable for a separate program like mine and would like to append those letters at the beginning of your title, feel free to do so and then be responsive to the deadline or lack of a deadline in some of our programs in chemistry now and across NSF uh, suited to that solicitation. So the next question is asking about the MRI program, which you mentioned earlier in your presentation, asking if we can talk about the changes coming to MRI. And we had a session yesterday, actually, uh, Randy Phelps uh, presented a session on MRI and uh, at this point, we can't talk about the changes that will be in the solicitation because it hasn't been cleared and approved yet. So it's not out there. Needless to say, uh, we, uh, 
we are looking at the requirements uh, of the legislation of the chips and science legislation, um, which um, eliminate cost sharing uh, for the next five years for MRI and for the noise program. Um, so I would I'm going to put in this answer a link to the presentation that Randy gave yesterday. Um, and you'll be able to hear exactly what he said because he answered uh, he provided the kind of the company line on uh, on <laughs> MRI. So I'm going to drop that in there now. So now you can you can go to the answer tab and see the link to that presentation. Jeremy is actually in the policy office, so he's the perfect person other than Randy who runs MRI to answer that question. The only thing I can add to Jeremy's answer is that we have to give you 90 days after the solicitation posts to respond. To write it. So the deadline will be no more than 90 days beyond the posting of the, or no less than 90 days beyond the posting of the solicitation. So you'll have time to think if, about it if it happens. Yeah, which means that the deadline that you may have been used to for MRI will change uh, because it was mid January and obviously we're closer than 90 days from that. So it's about all we can say at this point. Yeah. Um, Let's see, this is a thank you for the explanation between a workshop and a conference. Um, good. Next question is, let's see, this person anonymous is saying, I'm affiliated with a soft money institute, not a university. How can I fund a single undergraduate student? That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, the new PAPG, which is coming out it's out. Well, it's already it's out, out, but it will be going into effect in January. Has I would use the word liberalized, but Jeremy, you're the policy expert. Has liberalized our ability to fund things like uh, soft money institutes that are doing science research relevant to NSF, but in response to proposals. So if you are doing research which you could submit to NSF as a proposal, any division, any directorate. Uh, that requires an undergraduate student, either one to whom you have access because of an affiliation with a nearby university or one you want to recruit as a participant. Um, you could write such a proposal if it, uh, you know, I suppose you could probably even, Jeremy, this is a policy question. Could such a person apply to the REU solicitation? I believe they're eligible. They would be eligible. the The organization would be eligible to apply to the REU. Uh, that's another solicitation that is going to be updated. So you want to look for that because that's an old. I think it has a, a fourteen in front of it. So that's a, gives you the indication that that fiscal year was a, quite a long time ago. Um, and all of these solicitations are being updated, also to deal with the transition from Fastlane to research.gov. So um, I I don't think there are eligibility restrictions prohibiting that in the solicitation, but you'd want to look at it to make sure. And, and what I would say, if you chose to go that route, to be competitive, you'd want to impact more than one undergraduate student. You'd want to, the, the broader impacts component of that kind of proposal include among other things, how many people will be impacted. So consider that if it's appropriate, but try to make it broad. Uh, this question is asking if the NSF is planning to host in-person new investigator workshops in the future. I can't speak to that. I don't know. Does MPS do workshops for new investigators or for workshops generally? Uh, what yes. would those be? Uh, we do indeed. MPS does as a directorate. Chemistry does as a division, and I think each of the divisions within the directorate probably also run divisional young faculty workshops. Uh, we're probably not supposed to call them young faculty, early faculty workshops. Uh, and I know that uh, we are in the early stages of planning the next chemistry version of that. Uh, you might subscribe to the chemistry newsletter if you want to be among the first to know the official date when it's set. Uh, but it I am. I expect there to be such a workshop in calendar 23. There was one in calendar 22. There was also an MPS wide workshop in calendar 22. And I believe both of those calendar 22 events were live. OK, um, this is asking about the next question is asking about specific uh, eligibility requirements for the leaps 
uh, program. I don't know if you want to take a stab at that. I can also put a link to the um, to the solicitation mm -hmm. here uh, because you will find in this solicitation uh, not only who may submit proposals, but who may who may serve as a PI um, in there. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I dropped that in there into the into the question. Uh, so we still have about, you know, five to eight minutes left. I uh, don't have any additional questions, but if you have them, please send them to us now. Um, otherwise, uh, we will wrap this session up. And I thank you very much for your questions. I am KCOOK at NSF.gov. If you think of another question or you have a question that you would rather not share with uh, 160 strangers, <laughs> uh, feel free to email me. And uh, I appreciate your attendance at this session. And Jeremy, I appreciate your help. I was really lucky to land you as my, my partner because uh, the things I don't know, you write. <laughs> Happy, happy, happy to help. Uh, so thank you, Kelsey, for, for really doing a great, a great job today. And thank you for joining us. And uh, we do have one more round of sessions today at three o'clock uh, for some additional uh, NSF directorate sessions. So we hope to see you there and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.